we don't know about, that can take this sea, the raging seas of our lives, the turmoil of our lives, and turn it into a sea of glass, of peace and tranquility. The only name that de devils fear. Mountains have to get up and get into the sea at that name. It's a privilege to minister before you today. It's always a privilege. This is a great church. If you would turn in Luke chapter 11, verses 2 and 4, and then I'll read Matthew 18, 21 through 22. The Lord's been speaking to this church for several weeks, maybe even months now, certain themes, and I just want to go with the flow to fill the role that he would have me in that for tonight. And then I'll turn it over to a, a man that I truly greatly um, admire and look forward to what God has to say through him tonight. In Luke chapter 11, 2 through 4, it says, And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then turning to Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, it says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee, unto seven times, but unto seventy times seven. Jesus, I pray, God, that you would bless this time, Lord, and, and the role that you have placed me in this service. God, help me to communicate the message that you have for me to communicate to them, Lord Jesus. Touch every ear today and every mind to understand and every heart to receive, God. Just move among us, Lord Jesus. Lord, it is your service. Have your way, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I've simply titled this, The Power of Forgiveness. The Power of Forgiveness. Forgiveness defined, the act of forgiving, the, parting, the pardon of an offender by which he or she is considered and treated as not guilty. It means never to be remembered. The pardon or remission of an offense or crime as the forgiveness of sin or of injuries. Forgiveness defined also says deposit, the disposition to pardon, willingness to forgive. Remission of debt, fine, or penalty. Forgiveness. There was a Reader's Digest article I read one time called The Power of Forgiving. And it st stated this about what stress does on the human body. It says, because the fact that we are all made and we are wired to treat any tension-inducing event, our bodies release stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, which speeds up our hearts and our breath quickens and our mind races. Sugars in our body are released to rev up muscles and clotting factors surge in the blood. This is harmless if this is just a short, brief, scarce event. But if on all the time, it's actually toxic to our body. This article went on to st state that this is what unforgiveness causes, and this can lead to cell atrophy and memory loss, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, hardening of arteries and heart disease. It can cause headaches and nausea and other sicknesses. I can think of three, maybe four people in my life where it wasn't their fault of what was done to them, but they had, because of unforgiveness, 
I see their bodies. They're constantly sick. And I can't help but think that it's related to unforgiveness in their lives. Because unforgiveness is simply a poison to your body. The article went on to state that when people forgave, they had less stress. Chronic back pain was reduced. There were reduced relapses in substance abuse. People's health just got better. One lady in the article stated that forgiving was the best gift I gave myself. Another article by John Hopkins Medicine stated that forgiveness can lower the risk of heart attack, improve cholesterol levels and sleep. It can reduce pain, blood pressure, levels in anxiety, depression, and stress. Research also points to, to an increase in the forgiveness to health connection as you age. An article published by Mayo Clinic stated much of the same, but added improved mental health, less hostility, and a stronger immune, immune system. They stated that it helped self-esteem and improved relationships. Unforgiveness is a weight. I like what the Bible says in Matthew 11 when it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy, are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Unforgiveness is not light. God's ways are perfect. His word is perfect. And again, science is playing catch up to the principles of, in, found in the Bible and the benefits to living by those principles. Simply put, to live God's way is the best way. In Mark 11, the Bible states this about forgiveness in 25 and 26. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you ought against any, that your fa Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. In Luke chapter 6, verse 36 and 37, it says, Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, it says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Unforgiveness turns into bitterness, or you could say it like this, bitterness is the fruit of unforgiveness. He who angers you controls you. Forgiving the offender frees you of that person's grip upon your life. The person that is hurt the most by unforgiveness is our own selves. Please remember that to forgive, it does not condone someone's act or actions. Hear that. To forgive does not condone someone's actions, what they did to you, but it does release you from the stranglehold of that anger. Brother Lee Stone King once stated this, to err is human, to forgive is divine. He who chooses not to forgive burns the bridge in which they have to cross. It's only a matter of time. The Bible says we must forgive in order to be forgiven. In Luke eleven four, it says, and forgive us of our sins for as I read in the beginning, for we also for forgive everyone else that's indebted to us and lead us not in temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
How many times do I need to forgive? The other opening scripture. Matthew 18, 22. Jesus saith unto him, I say unto you, unto you, until seven times seventy. That's 490 times. So I wake up early one day. I come over to Pastor Smith's house and he greets me and quickly slaps me a hundred times in the face. And he says, I for, uh, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. I don't know what overcame me. <laughs> and it's only been a hundred times, so I forgive you, brother. And I start helping him with something at his house, and he all of a sudden stops and slaps me another hundred times. And then he, oh, man, I am so sorry, brother. Can you forgive me? Yes. That's 200 times. Yes, I forgive you. <laughs> and because he keeps taking time to slap me, it's taking us so long to do what I'm trying to help him to, to get accomplished at his house, and he slaps me again. 300, another 100 times. Brother, forgive me. Now it's 10 o'clock at night, and he slaps me another 100 times. Brother, forgive me. At 11 o'clock p.m., he slaps me 90 more times. 490 times. Forgive me, brother. Oh, I forgive you. Then he wasn't counting, so he forgets. And at 11.59 and 30 seconds, he slaps me again. Now, my gloves are off, because that's for the 491st time. I... I I don't, I don't think that's what God intended. I think he was really trying to say, you know what, forgive. Because how many, how, who's going to offend us 490 t times in a day? There was once a minister that heard that a brother was going around telling people things about him that simply were not true. This troubled the minister. And some would say, well, you have a right to get back at him. You have a right to speak your mind. Stick it to him. But that's not how he was. One day he went to that actual brother and said, could you ever find it in your heart to forgive me? The one who was hurt asked the herder, can you forgive me? The result was that that man who was hurting him, saying the wrong things about him, broke down crying and said, you never did anything wrong. And then that guy went around correcting all the damage that he had done. You have heard, love your neighbor as yourself. There's two loves in there. One is love your neighbor and love yourself. Forgiving is an act of love. If you're willing to forgive your neighbors, how much more should you forgive yourself? How much more should you forgive yourself? There's some of us beat ourselves up over things we've done way in the past. And we struggle in our walk with God because of mistakes we've made. You, you, you doubt at times, or your enemy, the Satan, comes and tells you, he's not forgiven you for that. And this hinders your walk. But if God would ask us to forgive 490 times in a day, would he ask us to do something that he himself is not willing to do? We are our own worst enemies, and we need to forgive ourselves. And as Brother William said on Sunday, we need to realize who we are. If we have repented and have been baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, we are forgiven. We are a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
We are a blood-bought child of the king. And as a child of the king, we have authority, we have power, and we have rights, and we can definitely sit and have victory over the things that have plagued us in the past. Don't keep yourself down. Rise up. Don't let Satan beat you down. Rise up. Rejoice not against me, O oh, my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Rise up and be the prince or the princess that God wants you to be. Satan is powerless to stop the church head on. He can't. He doesn't have that kind of power and authority. But if he can get a brother or sister mad at another brother or sister in the church, he will cause disunity, and this hurts the church from within. The Apostle Paul stated this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, forgive I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. The Apostle Paul knew Satan's weapons, and he also knew of the power of forgiveness. He knew that forgiveness breaks Satan's power. It spoils his plan to disrupt the unity within the church. If we are ever looking for a perfect congregation to go to, we will not find one. And if you find one and go there, it's probably no longer perfect. So each of us need to forgive each other's faults. Satan has no power over a faithful, loving, forgiving church. He cannot break unity, and he sure cannot stop revival and the harvest of souls in a church that is faithful, that is loving, that is quick to forgive. Thank you, Jesus. There has been themes being preached lately by different ministers and God often communicates to this church through multiple ministers in this church and even guest ministers who come to this church and lately there has been a theme on forgiving and a theme of knowing who we are in Christ why What is the purpose of all that? Is it because we're just terrible? No. It's because of God, what God has promised to do through this church and will do. But he needs a spiritually healthy church. It's been said before that revival is not a bunch of souls coming in. Revival is like when in Second. Uh, Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Revival is when God's people humble themselves, consecrate themselves, dedicate themselves, love each other, forgive each other, pray one for another. That is real revival. And Satan can do nothing to stop that. Healthy mothers have an easier time giving birth. Likewise, when a church humbles themselves and becomes stronger in Christ, then God can send a harvest of souls. The harvest of souls that he so desires for this area. God is wanting to send a harvest of souls, and he needs us to be strong, unified church that is quick to love and quick to forgive. 
a church that is one mind, one accord, one intention, ready to fight the good fight of faith, to stand up to whatever Satan is going to try to throw in our past, to say, not in our house, not in our community, not in Chicagoland. We will not stand for it in the name of Jesus Christ. God loves his church and he wants to use us for revival. The power of forgiveness, it changes lives. Who are we not to forgive when Jesus stood on a cross, went up on a cross? Just think of what he went through. They whipped him. The Bible says that it was, he was be marred beyond recognition. They plucked his beard out of his face. I mean, I, it hurts when someone hit, pulls my hair. But that's that. They pulled his whiskers out of his face. Then you couldn't recognize him because of his beating. And then they took him to a not, not a nice, finished, polished cross, but a rough, sawn, or hewed cross with lots of splinters. And they laid him down on that cross and then took the nail and a hammer and nailed his feet and his hands to that cross. Then they picked it up. and dropped it down in a hole so the cross would stand. And I can't imagine the pain that would have been felt as those splinters went into his already open wounds. And what did he say on the cross? Father, forgive them. Who are we to not do likewise with our brothers and our sisters? I think it'd be really good if we would just stand for just a couple minutes and just lift your hands toward God. And let's take the word we've just heard and apply it. And if there's something in your life that you've been holding, you need to pray and ask God to help you to have the grace and the mercy from him to reach out to an individual and forgive. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for its power. Thank you for its cleansing power, God. Help us to walk in forgiveness, Jesus. God, I'm so thankful for that, Lord. Thankful for that, Lord. You forgave me, Lord, uh, so much, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. In your name, Jesus. In your name, we receive your forgiveness, and we extend that same forgiveness to those around us, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Anything that comes from the Word of God is of no value if we actually don't apply it. Then we're hearers of the Word and not doers. And the Word has some pretty strong stuff about people like that. So when we have a message like this, it's so important that we take that Word and not just internalize it and think about it, but we actually make an application to it. If... I don't know anybody that's ever lived in life that has gone through all of life without being offended. <laughs> and I also don't know anybody that's gone all through the life who hasn't offended somebody. So we stand here not only in need of forgiveness, but need to extend that. Hallelujah. Amen. Brother Doug started his message and actually referenced one of the verses, and passages, scriptures that I'm going to share with you. I want to read from Daniel chapter 6, 16, and 17. And then we're going to read from Jonah. And then we're going to read from the book of Matthew. Cognizant of the time, so I'm going to read them very quickly. Daniel chapter 6, 16 says, Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. 
And a stone was brought and laid it upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then going to book of Jonah, chapter 1, verses 15, 16, and 17, says, So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jesus was speaking of this in Matthew 12, 40, and we don't need to turn there. But he said, for as Jonah was, in the, uh, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days, three nights in the earth. So I don't know if it was a fish or a whale, but um, we're going to believe tonight that it was a fish and a whale. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 says, And when he was entered into his ship, his disciples followed him. Verse 24, And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves. But he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And you may be seated, and I'd like to speak for just a little bit about a line of fish in a really bad storm. A line of fish in a really bad storm. It's interesting that the picture in the screen is that of a blue whale, if you can see that in the upper right-hand corner. It's the largest creature uh, known to man and probably one of the oldest. They saw, I saw pictures of a blue whale that had died and washed up on the shore. They had a I don't know what you would call it, a, like a bulldozer, a small bulldozer on top of the whale. That's how big this thing was. Monstrous. So it would really not be that difficult to swallow a man. <laughs> right? It wasn't a largemouth bass. I know that. I don't know if you've, uh, if you've ever been driving someplace and you thought you knew where you were going because it was so familiar only to discover after some period of time that you had no idea where you were and how to get out of where you were at. And then to make matters worse, discovered, you know, there's these neighborhoods around the Chicago area that um, they look very, very similar, right? And, and you get into them, and if you don't know where you're at, you can't get out. You might have to call 911 because the roads go all kinds of crazy ways. And you might be one neighborhood off, the houses look the same, they're built at the same time, they look the same, and you're absolutely sure that you know where you're at because it looks familiar, only to find out it's not familiar at all. Have you ever had that sense of deja vu? That you've been someplace before, you've experienced something before? Now there are those who believe that that is indication of reincarnation in life, you know, we've lived before, which is a bunch of hooey. I don't know if that's a technical term or not, but it works. Right? It's a bunch of hooey, right? <laughs> Whatever that is. I've heard that since I was a kid, and I still don't know what a hooey is, but it's a bunch of it anyway. Psychologists have researched this, and they've come up with some ideas as to why deja vu, but you all know what I mean. It's a sense of familiarity, but really, you've never experienced it before, but your brain is telling you you've experienced this before. Right? Uh, a few months ago, earlier part of this year, um, I had a Volkswagen wagon that Jetta that I really, really liked, but Volkswagen did some illegal things, so the federal government told them they had to buy my car back from me. So I bought it three years ago, something like that, put on a lot of miles, and they paid me almost $19,000 for a car that I paid twenty two for. I thought that was pretty good. So I went out and bought a 2005 Chevy Malibu that's silver, Malibu LT, only to discover there's 10 million other people that have bought the same car. Okay, maybe not 10 million, but a lot of people. To what? 2015? Has it been a year already? Oh, my car is not a 2005. It's a 2015. Sorry. Um, that's the other half of the preacher. 
just helping me out. Well, it's really odd. So, you know, I've got a, I've got a key clicker, right? Brother War is here. He knows all about key clickers. So I got this key clicker, and I, I, walked into this, uh, I walked into a store, and I did some shopping and whatever, and I came back out, and I walked down the aisle, and I saw my car. And I walked up to the car, and I clicked the thing and went to open the door, and the, or the door doesn't open. I go, what's wrong with my clicker? So, of course, if the first clicking didn't click it, then you click it again, right? So... I'm going to step out of preacher mode for just a minute. As an IT person, if you double-click on something that doesn't work, don't double-click it again. <laughs> I, I, I clicked it again and went to open the door, and it wouldn't open. And I'm thinking, great, the battery in my clicker is dead. Now what do I do? So I flip the key out, and I'm going to unlock the car. I can't get the key in the lock. What is going on? Then I realized, as I'm looking around, dumbfounded as to why my key clicker won't work, I'm in the wrong aisle. And the 2015 silver Chevy Malibu LT that I'm trying to get into isn't mine. Mine is one aisle over. And then you look around to see if anybody noticed. <laughs> right? There's a familiarity only to find out that it's not real. Right? It, it's, well, so it felt familiar, it felt right, but it has no basis in reality. And you're thinking, what in the world does this have to do with that? Because we all go through circumstances and situations in life, and they all feel the same. When Daniel was being thrown into the lion's den, when Jonah was being thrown over the side of the boat, when the disciples are on the ship being tossed all over the place, it felt the same. You'll get there. When a brother doesn't forgive us, it doesn't make any difference whether it is a perceived hurt or a real hurt. It still hurts. The challenge, of course, with the perceived hurt is how do, you, how do you deal with that? Nothing happened, but it felt like it. Brother Doug mentioned that Satan will try to disturb us, and we heard about unity. Satan wants to destroy us. You understand that, right? When Jesus said that the thief cometh not to, but to kill, steal, and destroy, he wasn't just making up words. He, he was saying something that's very critical for us to understand. Satan is not your friend. No matter how he dresses it. Right? And I think sometimes we forget that. The world is not our friend. I'm talking about cosmos. I'm not talking, you know, people. I'm talking about the systems of the world. The systems of the world are not designed and intended to benefit our life. They're intended to destroy us. So we are people living in a country that feels familiar, but it's not real. I'm not talking about some kind of alternate reality or parallel universe. I'm not talking about that. When you came to Jesus Christ, I want you to listen to this very carefully because we forget this. You came to Jesus Christ and you surrendered your life to him and to his kingdom and to his will and to his word. When he received you, if you will, you transferred your citizenship from the citizenship of this world to a citizenship of a world that you have not yet been to. This world is fake. Oh, it's real. We got trees and we got life and you pinch yourself, you hit yourself in the head or your brother slaps you 490 times. You're going to feel it. It's real. But this isn't real, real. Does that make sense? What's real is eternity. That's real. This is a preparation. This is a, 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 a foundation. This is a walkway to get us to eternity. And when you transferred your allegiance from this world to his world, this world should not have a hold and governance over our thoughts and our life. I'm not talking about government. I'm talking about governance. Does that make sense? 
I'm not of this world. Some of you already knew that. Neither of you. I am a citizen of a country in which I have never seen. But there are times that the familiarity of this world confuses me. I'm walking up to the wrong car trying to get in. It's because it's not the right car. So if the world feels somewhat familiar, but you're going through something and it doesn't seem to fit right, that's because it's not supposed to fit right. Does that make sense? So Daniel, there are three, three different situations here. But if we look, and I intentionally read only the tail end of the situation, right? Many of you know the story of Daniel, the story of Jonah, and the story of disciples on the ship in the storm. Some of you may not know all the details of that, but Daniel was a righteous guy. He prayed three times a day. And a bunch of guys looked at him and were jealous of him, so they figured out this way to get Daniel into trouble. And it didn't stop Daniel from praying, which is what they were hoping would happen. So long story short, they trapped him through the king, and then they watched and said, sure enough, he's praying. Oh, king, <laughs> you got to throw him in the den of lions. Daniel didn't do one thing wrong. Identify something that he did wrong. Right? I, I did, did he, what, what, what did he do wrong? In God's eyes, nothing. And we go through circumstances and situations and all we find, we, are, we find ourselves in this place of what we think is judgment. It's got a familiar feel to it because we've been in bad situations before. But it has nothing to do with us doing something wrong. Daniel did a lot of things right. Daniel did so many things right that he was elevated in the kingdom, which is got what got everybody else upset. So when he was thrown into the den of lions, he wasn't thrown there because of some gross sin. No, the three situations that we've identified is Daniel was getting judgment because of his obedience to God. Jonah was getting judgment because of his disobedience to God. The disciples, they actually obeyed Jesus, and you'll see that in a minute. They followed him, but they were just in the wrong place at the right time. Life. Sometimes life just happens. The challenge is that the way life just happens, it feels like we're being judged. And we get confused, and we look to God and say, what did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. It's just life. Oh, come on now. No, none of you have ever experienced a flat tire? On a Monday morning on your way to work? <laughs> okay, something just happened with Phil there. <laughs> hmm. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45 says, that ye, may, that ye may be the father of your children which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. What? And sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. What? You know, you can pray and fast and it rains and your basement still floods, just like your neighbor who is as, as filthy and a dirty of a rotten sound of sinner as that you would ever find. It's not God's mad at you. Right? Neither is it the devil trying to trip you up. It's just life. That's hard for us to separate. So when we look at Daniel, we say, oh man, he was thrown into the den of lions because he was doing so good. Yes, that's true. But it felt bad. Now I don't know how Daniel felt because it doesn't tell us. It sounds to me, and you read the scripture, where he was okay with it. I don't, you know, I'm thinking when I'm reading the story, I'm looking at that and going, man, if I came and I'd been praying and I was at the window and I was facing east and I was crying out to God and all of a sudden, bang, 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 they're knocking on my door and they come and drag me out and, and take me before the king and he says, you've done wrong and I'm going to throw you in jail. I'd be going, what? God. 
Come on. Good morning. <laughs> but Daniel, I, I find it interesting that the king says, the God your servant is going to be, it's, he's going to take care of this for you. Boy, isn't it amazing when somebody who is unsaved and unregenerated actually reminds us of the blessings of God? You sort of go, oh, yeah. Daniel's in the lion's den. He did nothing wrong. So the question would be, why did this happen? Because we always want to know why. At least I do. I always want to know why. Why? My kids, when they're little, as many kids do, they'd ask you all those 900,000 why questions. And everyone, every time you answer it, they would ask another why. I don't know what came over me. I, I have no idea. It just... I don't remember which kid it was. They were, why, why, why? And I said, because the aborigines in South Africa are revolting. <laughs> there aren't aborigines in South Africa. That's what came to mind. What I do remember is they looked at me and went, oh, and walked away. And I went, yes! And I can assure you, every time there was a why that I didn't want to answer, I just said the aborigines of South Africa are revolting. It's like, and when I said revolting, I didn't mean like bad and horrible. I meant they're in war. Whatever. They didn't know what it meant. They didn't know what an aborigine meant. They didn't know where South Africa was. So I guess I was okay. See, we think, why? Why does this happen? Well, the interesting thing is, Daniel, who was elevated in the kingdom already, and there was jealousy against him. The king recognized that God was on his side. After the Daniel lion done thing and Daniel came out, guess what happened? King Darius said in Daniel 6.25, he published this proclamation to every race, color, and creed on the earth. Peace to you, abundant peace. I decree that Daniel's kingdom, sh God, shall be worshipped and feared in all the parts of my kingdom. He is the living God, world without end. His kingdom never falls. His rule continues eternally. He is a savior and a rescuer. He performs astonishing miracles in heaven and on earth. He saved Daniel from the power of the lions. This is a heathen king pro proclaiming through his entire kingdom that Daniel's God is the only God. Why did that happen? Because Daniel was doing the right thing at the right time and somebody got upset and God took that circumstance and situation and turned it around for his glory. You got to remember that every time God does something in his life, every time Satan, I should say, does something against us, God will take that and turn it right back against Satan and use that very thing to bring judgment against Satan. It's not a coincidence that when David killed Goliath, that he picked up Goliath's own sword to cut off his head. That is such poetic justice. It's beautiful. So if you're doing right and you're living right and all of a sudden you're finding yourself in a lion's den, hang tight because God is fixing to do something powerful through that situation to change the minds and opinions of even heathen nations. Now I was reading that from the message translation and it says this, from then on, Get this, this is just blew my mind. Daniel was treated well during the reign of Darius. Great, he was already treated well. Ah, but it doesn't stop there. And also in the following reign of Cyrus the Persian. See, we, we have to understand what's going on in the circumstance that we find ourselves. We, I, look at Daniel, and because I can read the whole chapter beginning to end in one sitting, I get the whole picture. It's harder to do when I'm living it because I, I, don't, I can only see this little slice of bread. I don't see what God is getting ready to do when I come out of the lion's den. I'm not sure exactly what, who saw what to get me to that point. I can only look at this little slice, and I get confused because, wait a second, I was doing this, 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 and now I get this? Two plus two is not equal to four here. It's coming up with three and a half. 
So if you've been walking right and talking right and living right and praying right and doing right and witnessing right and all of a sudden you find yourself seemingly in a place of captivity, hang tight because God is getting ready to use that circumstance to bring about glory and honor to his kingdom and to elevate you into a place you could not be without it. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to Jesus. Jonah. Now Jonah was a different dude. I don't know, we don't know really much about Jonah except he was the son of some guy and apparently he had a conversation and relationship with God. We really don't know what. I'm assuming he was a prophet but we don't really know that. The Bible doesn't really tell. Also, we got this book called Jonah, and everybody thinks about Jonah, and they think about this great fish or this whale, and they also think about the fact that when the story was all done, he's sitting out on the side of the hill having a picnic and a pity party because God actually forgave them. Sounds like a really bad TV preacher to me. See, Jonah was tested and tried because of the correction of God. And to a certain extent, we get that. Right? Uh, You're a dad. Did you ever correct one of your kids, kids incorrectly? Meaning, it was the other guy that did it, but you thought this guy did it, and so you disciplined this guy, and this guy's going, he, 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 he. That ever happen? Perhaps. Maybe. (laughs) Plead the fifth. Because you got kids here, right? (laughs) See, God doesn't make mistakes like that. Right? It's a good thing. Otherwise, Michael Hudson would be in a lot of trouble because he and I have spent a lot of time together and all of a sudden God goes, oh, Michael Hudson did that and it was really me. No, if he's correcting you, it's because you needed it. As parents, you know, that whole thing, I heard it from my dad, my mom. I don't know, hopefully I never said it, but this hurts me more than it hurts you. Did I say that? Yeah, well, forgive me, please. (laughs) See, correction comes because of love. Jonah was specifically making decisions and choices that were in direct disobedience to the choices that God was requiring. He intentionally, willfully, with knowledge, made a decision to violate God's commandment. Dude, when you do that, you are in trouble. You, you, if, if you're surprised when correction comes, you've got some other issues going on that need attention. Because you're not living in reality. I, I'm just telling you. There is no question that Jonah needed to have happen what happened. The problem with it is Look at how many other people it negatively impacted. They lost a whole shipful of goods and materials. Tossed them overboard. All because Jonah was asleep in the bottom of the ship. Really? The guy that caused it all is sound asleep? Yep. Not because he had a clear conscience, but because, because he wasn't listening. He shut it off. Hmm. See, when God spoke to Jonah, it was not a request. It was not, hey, Jonah, if you could find the time next Saturday, I would really greatly appreciate it if you would consider it on my part, if you would head over there to Nineveh, and and, and if you can find in the goodness of your heart to preach to them, I would really greatly appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, parents, you go to your kids, and you say, now I know that you never selected the wrong person, but you go to your kids, and you say, you know, clean up your room. You're not expecting them to go, was that an option? No parents looking at their kids right now. See, we got to understand that there are times that we feel like we're being corrected because 
We are. And we ought to be. If we have unforgiveness in our spirit, do you think God's going to overlook that and say, it's all right, I get it. You, you, it it's, you're, you're deserving of that. No, he may bring something, all those ailments that you were talking about. Read the book of Psalms. When David sinned, his bones were like water. Now, he wasn't necessarily trying to forgive somebody, but that's the same kind of health issues that were happening because of unforgiveness. God's going to correct you because he loves you too much to let you go on. Because if he doesn't correct you and you continue to live your life that way, guess where you're going to end up? Not in the belly of a whale, but in the belly of. God loves you too much to not correct you. Besides, if he doesn't correct you, you won't be able to impact the people that you need to impact for the kingdom of God. In verse 17 of this chapter, the Bible says, Now the Lord had prepared... A great fish. When that whole thing, when he headed down to, to the shipyards and he bought his ticket to get on the ship to go to Tarshish, God went, yeah, I know what I'm going to do here. Here, fishy, fishy, fishy. You go swimming over here because I'm going to send a storm. Da, da, da. Think, of, think of all the parameters that would have to go in to make sure in the middle of a storm that the ship would wind up where it needed to be and the, sh and the fish would wind up where it needed to be in the middle of a great storm with all the wind and all the waves and everything that they're in the right place that when Jonah went, woo, that the fish was right there. I turned this way so I wouldn't be at the camera. <laughs> God orchestrated all that. When God is correcting you, he's going to make sure he puts you in the situation that he needs to put you in to make sure that the outcome is what it needs to be. Don't fight against the correction of God. If that correction is there, it's there for a reason. It's there for your benefit. It's there to improve you. It's there to bring you closer to him and make you into a situation where you can impact people that only you can impact. Yeah, so the disciples, Jesus is preaching, man, that, they're having, they are having church. People are getting healed and all kinds of great things going on. And I, I mean, it's, it's a Pentecostal revival. I could just imagine. Place is packed, standing room only. I guess they were all standing actually, but, right? Come on, lighten up, folks. <laughs> it, and Jesus says, I, I, I want to leave here. So if you read the Bible carefully, it says that Jesus got into the boat and the disciples followed him. I never picked that up before until earlier today. It wasn't that he said, okay, guys, at least in the book of Matthew, at least, guys, get in the boat, and then we're going to go over to the other side. He said, I'm going to get in this boat, and all the disciples says, if he got in the boat, I'm getting in the boat. That's a good plan, by the way. If Jesus gets in the boat in your life, you might want to get in with him. Now then, it's very possible that Jesus knew a storm would come. It's very possible that he orchestrated all that. But the Bible doesn't tell us that. So I'm not going to assume that. It's possible. But it doesn't tell us that. So when I look at this, I look at it as a storm of life. It just happened. It's, it's just... The atmospheric conditions were such upon that day that the storm arose. The Sea of Galilee was notorious for sudden, terrible storms. Just poof! Because of its geographic, and I won't go all that kind of stuff, location. So they get in the boat. There's a really, really high probability, although I can't prove it scripturally, that there were other boats on the water at the same time. I tell you that because if the disciples are in the boat with Jesus and there's a storm, there's probably a boat yonder that's in the same storm. The difference is Jesus wasn't in their boat. Did you get that? If Jesus gets in the boat, you better get in with him. And you don't want to get in the boat and head off across the lake and leave him on the shore. See, the problem is that all through Scripture we have examples of this, and I got a few examples in my own life where I thought 
I was supposed to go across the lake. So I got in the boat, and I start, well, not walking, rowing, only to find out Jesus still standing on the shore saying, Hello! Obviously, I'm the only one that's ever done that. See, when we get into a storm of life, it feels the same as the judgment for correction, and it feels the same as if we're in the den of lions because we did good. It's really hard for our flesh to navigate those differences, and that's what I'm trying to bring to you. It feels the same. There's a familiarity with it all, but it doesn't mean that it's the same thing. And I think we get confused sometimes when life comes and life happens. We think, I'm being judged. No, you're not. It's life. But then it's easy to get mixed up too, Pastor Betcher, and you think, oh, this is just life when it's God trying to correct you. Now, I know this isn't run the aisles stuff right now. It's okay. You'll run the aisles later when you get it. Matthew, I said this, Matthew 8, 23, and when he entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. What was the result of this trial? They get in the ship, they're going across, Jesus is sound asleep, the disciples are freaking out, going, ah, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to perish? Do you honestly think that God would have let that boat go down? Of all the boats in the world, that one wasn't sinking. And if it did sink, who, you know what's going to happen? Everybody in that boat is going to come back to the top and be in perfectly good health. God wasn't going to let Jesus drown. He had a cross to come to. I think I would have rather drowned. I I don't mean that jokingly. I mean, we just heard about the cross. Right? Jesus wakes up, and he stands up, and he says in Matthew 8, 26, Why were you fearful, O ye of little faith? Apparently, he said that while he was still laying down, because then he arose, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? I'm here to tell you tonight that when storms of life come, They must needs come because it's only in the midst of the storm that the power and authority of Jesus Christ can be properly revealed in your life. Now, I'm I'm preaching something that I've been living the last few weeks. My wife and I, the other night, sat by each other and said, what are we doing wrong? I mean, if, if I, some of you know the story And I'm not going to tell you the story because it would decrease your faith. (laughs) It's been a tough couple weeks, I'll just say that. And in the middle of the night, I woke up and I went downstairs and sat in the chair and I went, what do I tell my wife? This is what I'm telling you, honey. It's okay to be in the midst of the storm because Jesus is in the ship with me. Or maybe I should say, I'm in the ship with Jesus. It's not because you did something wrong. It's not because you're living in sin. You're not under judgment. It's just life. But coming through that storm, God is going to reveal his power and his authority in a way you would have never been able to see without that storm. And if the musicians would come. How do we respond then? How do we know what the difference is? The Bible says that he has given the church the discernment of spirits. That's not the discernment of fault finding. There are some times you just need to pray and ask God, What is this? Not why, but what? Do you understand the difference? Not why is this happening, but what is happening? Daniel said, 
maintain a steadfast faith in God. So when we realize that we're in a trial, we realize that we're in a den of lions because we've been doing right things, hold fast. Those lions are not going to destroy you. Mm -mm. Hold fast. The king came and said, Daniel, still alive? My God sent his angel who closed the mouths of these lions so they would not hurt me. I've been found innocent before God and also before you, O king. I've done nothing to harm you. Wow. Jonah, in the belly of that whale, cried out unto God for deliverance with repentance and confession. He said, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. You say, God, what is going on here? Do you think God is going to withhold that from you? If there's sin in your life and you sincerely, honestly come before God and say, God, would you reveal whatever it is? Do you think he's going to go, Figure it out. No. He'll say, brother, you need to stop slapping your brother 490 times. That's why your life is messed up. And now then you know what to do. Tie your hands behind your back. Do something. If you've got some kind of problem that you can't control at, something Jesus help me and then you're going to go to your brother and say I am so sorry and no I'm not going to slap you again <laughs> you got to repent Jonah repented stand with me in Matthew chapter 8 verse 29 I already quoted it but the disciples said woke him saying Lord save us we perish I want to be careful what I say here because God never sleeps. We just may interpret that he's asleep because it seems that he's not responding. And because we can only relate to him through the eyes of humanity because that's all we know, we sometimes misinterpret his lack of response for either lack of care, lack of attention, or I guess you could say he's just asleep. Have you ever prayed and the heavens felt like brass? God is not not listening. That didn't quite sound right, but I feel theologically it's right. He's listening. He's aware. He's not asleep. He's not like the prophets of Baal who cut themselves and slashed themselves and screamed all the louder trying to wake up their God. He's there. Sometimes he's not responding because the way we think because the test isn't over yet. There's still something that needs to bubble to the surface that he can scrape off so that you're more pure. It could be that You've repented, but one of those repentance that we give when we know we got caught rather than because we're sorry. When you honestly, sincerely come before God in repentance, the Bible says he will in no wise cast you out. I don't know where you're at in life. You might be a Daniel right now. You might be a Jonah. You might be the disciples. But I want to encourage you today. In all of that, God was in all of that. Thank you so much, Jesus, for the opportunity we have to come together. Would you take the word that Brother Stokes has shared with us and plant it into our hearts, God? Help us to forgive. Not with hesitation, but quickly. When we come to you and seek your forgiveness, you never hold it back. 
You're so quick to forgive that it amazes me. Help us to forgive one another. And Lord, then Jesus, when we come into the storms of life, the circumstances and situations, help us not to turn our head away from you, but to keep our eyes, our faces locked upon you. That you can perfect in us what you desire. And ultimately, Lord God, your glory is made manifest. Jesus. This world needs to see your glory made manifest. feel prompted right now just to remain silent so it's not that I'm lost for word I want God's spirit to just minister keep playing brother Tim keep playing thank you Jesus thank you Jesus would you just reach over and put your hand on the shoulder of your neighbor Would you pray a prayer of blessing and strength upon them? God, thank you for these pastors. God, thank you, God, for these pastors. Jesus, hallelujah. Bless them today, God. Strengthen them today, Jesus. Hallelujah. 